I want to thank the organizers, the sponsoring organization, and the Frick for their interest in my speaking at a symposium filled otherwise with such distinguished speakers and participants. My lecture will trace the 130-year history from the late 1870s to the present of cloisonné enameling on glass substrate in Japan, discuss the artists involved, and present examples. I will describe the basic cloisonné manufacturing process on metal substrate, and then explain the variation and technique required to accommodate glass's properties. I will also distinguish Japanese cloisonné on glass from Japanese plicajure. Modern Japanese cloisonné enameling only began in the 1830s, when one man in Nagoya, Kaji Tsunekaji, discovered the secrets of making it by breaking apart a Chinese example. He created his own pieces and took on apprentices who in turn had apprentices, creating a lineage that by the 1890s included thousands of workers throughout Japan. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Japanese cloisonné enamels were frequently said to be the finest in the world and included a wide variety of techniques to achieve varying aesthetic effects. Although the vast majority of these pieces were on metal substrate, the Japanese also deposited cloisonné enamel on porcelain and lower fired ceramics, employing glass as the substrate proved by far the most difficult. The Japanese basic process of making cloisonné on metal, uh, which I think all of you probably know, can be followed in photographs produced circa 1900. First, the substrate is created, when the substrate is ready, the design is drawn on it. Then, flattened wires are individually cut to size, formed into the correct shape, and glued on edge to the metal surface. And the piece is fired for the first time to permanently affix the wires. Next, slightly moistened, finely powdered enamels, previously prepared at over 1300 degrees centigrade, are carefully placed among the wires. Then the piece is given its second firing at about 800 degrees to fuse the enamels to the substrate. The sequence of filling the cells with powder and refiring is repeated three, four, or more times until the cells are not only been filled, but the hardened enamels are above the wires. Then grinding begins, utilizing about a dozen increasingly fine abrasives until the enamels are ground down flush with the height of the wires, and then polishing achieves the ultimate mirror finish. The wires may be gilded, and the last step is usually the addition of top and bottom rims. When ceramic was the substrate, when ceramic was the substrate, the Japanese process was for the most part similar to metal. The great English designer Christopher Dresser said that he had, quote, observed every detail of the process, close quote, during the 1876 to 7 trip to Japan he made, and he reported, quote, in all respects, the manufacturing resembles that of cloisonné metal objects, save in the fixing of the wires to earth instead of soldering them to metal, close quote. Likewise, the German chemist living in Japan, Gottfried Wagner, wrote in 1876 that the process was similar to that used for metal. They and other writers fail to mention the most significant difference from the manufacture of metal substrate cloisonné, time required in the kiln. Metal substrate enamels were inserted cold into an already hot kiln and then removed into cool air a few minutes later. Ceramic substrate cloisonné, to the contrary, requires the long warm-up and cool-down periods normal to ceramic production. In order to complete a ceramic cloisonné piece, firing must be done multiple additional times, each time with the long heating and cooling, to attach the wires and completely fill the cells. The Japanese, who had a centuries-long history creating diverse and superb ceramics, mastered this process quite quickly, producing ceramic cloisonné by the mid-1860s and making huge quantities of it during the 1870s when it was aggressively exhibited and sold at domestic and international expositions. Glass substrate cloisonné to a layman no, excuse me, is known in Japanese as garasutai jippo, meaning glass body enamel. Intuitively, to a layman anyway, it might seem easier to adhere enamel support separated by wires to a chemically and structurally related glass surface rather than to a metal substrate. However, this is not the case. 
the somewhat different chemical makeup of the underlying glass versus that of the enamels used in manufacturing cloisonne, and glass's higher coefficient of expansion and greater mobility when heated compared to metal make glass a far more difficult medium to use as a substrate. Glass, like ceramic, requires slow buildup of temperature and lengthy cooling down in the kiln. Cracking and breakage occur during the cooling period and sometimes during heating, thus wasting a significant percentage. The larger the piece, the more likely to crack or break. In addition, when reheated, glass will often slump, distorting it often to the point of total disfigurement. The great Japanese master enameler, Takeuchi Chubei, was the first to make Gorosatai Jippo. It was an exceptional achievement at any date, but especially so at the time of his innovation in the late 1870s. And he was the only Japanese master to make Gorosatai during the entire 19th century. Takeuchi, working in Nagoya, Japan's most important enameling center, was an exceptionally adept artist who demonstrated a unique breadth of technical ability in Japan. In addition to his ceramic substrate, four examples of which I showed you earlier, he mastered cloisonne on metal, perhaps as early as the mid-1870s, and he won a bronze medal at the Paris 1889 Exposition, probably for metal substrate work, for by 1890, most of his exhibi exhibits at the third domestic exposition held in Tokyo were metal substrate. At the Chicago Columbian Exposition in 1893, he exhibited an imported, very technically sophisticated pair of metal substrate vases, almost two feet high, and one of those is on the screen. Takeuchi also produced unenameled, low-relief metalware pieces that were multicolored by patination among slightly raised lines created by stamping or etching. In 1895, he advertised himself as a porcelain manufacturer, apparently quite separate from his cloisonne work. Thus, Takeuchi produced objects of an unmatched variety in Japan, rivaling in diversity, though not in volume, major Western firms like Tiffany and Christoffel. Sadly, there is no evidence he continued his work on glass substrate after 1881, and he appears to have given it up before he learned to more fully exploit the medium. Takeuchi first exhibited his cloisonne on glass at Nagoya in 1878 and he then showed this pair of footed cloisonne on glass cups, now in the Tokyo National Museum, at the 1881 Second Domestic Exposition. The pair employ opaque enamels over the glass among the wires, rather than later masters transparent or translucent enamel that takes better aesthetic advantage of the underlying glass's transparency. No other examples of his work on glass are known, unfortunately. As previously shown, Takeuchi had been one of the most prolific early makers of cloisonne on ceramic during the early and mid-1870s, and in fact, the overwhelming majority of his extant work is porcelain substrate cloisonne. <coughs> Takeuchi's extensive experience making ceramic cloisonne must have been critical in helping him solve the related problems encountered working on glass. Likely important to Takeuchi, Takeuchi's success, with glass substrate at such an early date was his exposure to the brilliant German chemist, Gottfried Wagener, who aided in the development of Japanese enameling by introducing advanced European technology in the 1870s and whose expertise included glass as well as enamels. Wagner was born in Hanover, received his doctorate in 1852. He immediately moved to Paris where he attended lectures by Jean-Baptiste Dumas and specifically learned glass and enameling technique from him. Wagner arrived in Japan in 1868, bringing that knowledge with him. At that time, in the wake of the social political changes resulting from the 1868 Meiji Restoration, the new Japanese national and local governments were hiring Western experts to introduce advanced technology to Japan in order it to, it, for it to modernize. Wagner was one of the most prominent of these. In 1870, he improved the enamels used in Japan's ceramic industry, working with porcelain makers in Arita under the auspices of the prefecture's governor. Having aided the ceramic makers, Wagner became involved during the 1870s, among other work, in helping the growing cloisonne industry. 
Wagner was already involved with Cloisonnet by 1872. That year, as technical consultant to the Japanese delegation, he helped to choose the exhibits of Cloisonnet and other Japanese decorative arts for the Vienna World's Fair of 1873. By 1875, Wagner was in Tokyo working as professor at the School of Medicine, teaching at the School of Industry, and employed part-time by the German H. Ahrens Company, a decorative arts manufacturer and exporter that built the Tokyo Cloisonne factory in 1875 and employed many of the finest enameling artists from the Nagoya area. After Ahrens sold the factory in 1877, Wagner moved to Kyoto, where he taught at the city's chemical school. In addition to Cloisonne, Wagner lectured specifically on glass in Kyoto in 1878, quite possibly with Takayuchi and others from Nagoya in attendance, as Wagner's efforts were highly respected there, and they remain so today. It may be no coincidence that Takayuchi's success with glass substrate Cloisonne occurred at the time of those lectures and about the same time that other Japanese reportedly first produced more typical enamel on glass without wire work. Wagner derived much of his knowledge from the previously mentioned Jean-Baptiste Dumas, one of the foremost chemists of the 19th century with whom Wagner, as I said, studied in Paris. Dumas had been born in Alais, a town with glass manufactories, and he was the son-in-law of the director of the Sèvres porcelain factory. In 1823, Dumas moved to Paris, attaining membership in the Academy of Sciences. In 1832, he became a professor at the University of Paris and the Collège de France. Although best known for his work in organic chemistry, Dumas did important work on enamels and glass, for example, demonstrating in 1830 the proper ingredient ratio to maximize the durability of soda-lime silica glass, and publishing that year the second volume of his eight-volume masterwork, the second volume entitled Amai, Peinture en couleur vitrificable, Peinture sur verre sur Amai en couleur chimique. Although Dumas himself never went to Japan, his knowledge was transmitted by Wagner, and thus he might be viewed as the grandfather of Takeuchi's work. After a 30-year hiatus, a second Japanese enameler, Tsunakawa Aisaburo, once again created cloisonne on glass. Tsunakawa apprenticed in Nagoya, then moved to Kobe in 1897, and finally returned to Nagoya in 1904 or 5. His years in Kobe were critical, crucial to his technical advancement under the tutelage of the great master, Kaji Sataro, who was the second son of Kaji Tsunekaji, the 1830s originator of modern Japanese enameling, in the private cloisonne enameling studio of Baron Kawasaki Shozo. The Baron had an important collection of Ming cloisonne, and Sataro and Sunakawa's work there involved meeting the challenge of manipulating late 19th century Japanese wiring and enameling by then approaching unpitted, unmodeled mirror perfection to instead produce cloisonne that imitated Ming Dynasty cloisonne pieces made centuries before, intentionally creating all the flaws inherent in the early technology. A decade after his return to Nagoya, perhaps inspired by that success, Tsunakawa took up an equal or greater challenge to produce cloisonne on glass. From 1914, he worked on the problem, finally succeeding after seven years of effort, only to abandon the effort in 1921 to save himself financially, frustrated by the difficulties of manufacture and by the small demand for what must have been a very expensive item whose, pri whose price had to reflect the immense effort and numerous wasters. Another 60 years elapsed before Japanese artists once again took up the challenge of cloisonne on glass. Since the 1980s, progress has once again been made, this time in Kyoto rather than Nagoya. The initial success was made by Mrs. Inaba Haroyuki of the Inaba Cloisonne Company. The Inaba Company was founded circa 1871 using the trade name Kanunkin and subsequently acquired in 1889 by Inaba Shichiho I, a former samurai archery instructor who had been employed at the firm since the mid-1870s. For over 100 years, the company remained in business, winning both domestic and international accolades. The longest lasting and most successful cloisonne on metal substrate maker in Kyoto. 
It only ceased manufacture in, 18, excuse me, in 1994, and he remains in business as a wholesaler today. Mrs. Anaba, married to the great-grandson of Shichiho One, is a talented artist who continues to teach cloisonne making and to produce an occasional piece. She first made glass substrate cloisonne during the 1980s and continued to do so in the early 1990s. Unfortunately, the effort was not successful financially, and this work was abandoned in the mid-1990s once again because of the immense effort and kiln breakage of at least 30%. Two other makers in Kyoto have subsequently produced cloisonne on glass and done so for the first time on a profitable basis. After some 20 years of experimentation, the Biso company succeeded in the 1990s on a commercial scale. Biso was founded by Endo Taichi after World War II, initially as a manufacturer and wholesale of wires, metal substrate, and other items used in cloisonne making. During the 1870s, Endo became fascinated with the idea of making glass substrate cloisonne, and after long experimentation, he succeeded in doing so in the 1990s. The company continues to make a wide range of items, including jewelry, cups, trays, and vases, sold through, sold through various retailers in Kyoto. A third Kyoto maker, Azumo Yoko, in recent years succeeded in making Garasata Jippo after a decade of trial and error. Operating a small studio, Mrs. Azuma previously made metal substrate cloisonne, but turned her hand toward glass substrate to distinguish herself from the many other small manufacturers of metal-based cloisonne in Japan, and she continues to have success concentrating exclusively on glass substrate pieces. Although there are no records of the specific processes used by the two early Japanese glass substrate makers, interviews provide insight into the contemporary maker's methods. Unlike the two earlier masters, who as far as is known, deposited unmodified cloisonne enamels on typical commercial glass, these recent Japanese makers have succeeded in part by altering either the substrate glass or the applied enamel so their chemical formulas are more alike, thus creating similar coefficients of expansion. The specific formulas are kept very closely guarded secrets. In general, the contemporary process first requires making the glass substrate, usually in the form of a cup, bowl, or plate over a mold. The glass is fired upside down at varying temperatures of about 800 to 1,000 degrees centigrade, specific to each maker. Very thin, pure silver wires and enamels are then added to the glass surface, often while the mold remains in place. Biso, however, frequently does not use the mold after the glass has been created, relying instead on the strength of the glass substrate that they employ. The wires and enamels are fired at temperatures about 100 degrees lower than the glass. Each firing, as noted, requires a heat buildup and even longer cooling period to accommodate the glass substrate. Even after 100 years experiencing experience firing metal-based masterpieces in their own kilns, the Anaba firm I described earlier had to subcontract those kiln firing steps to a Nagoya company. So the glass substrates were first manufactured in Nagoya and then shipped back and forth to Kyoto for wiring, for enameling and polishing, and to Nagoya for each firing. An effort is often made to insert all the enamel powders during only one or two firings rather than the usual three, four, or more for typical metal substrate pieces in order to reduce both the risk of cracking and slumping as well as the time and expense of further enameling and firing sequences. The enamels and wires are then ground down level with each other and the mold is removed after which the piece is sandblasted if necessary to convert it from transparency to translucency for aesthetic reasons. After a piece is completed, tensions can remain in its structure and spontaneous cracks can subsequently emerge in an apparently perfect piece. To a casual observer, the resulting effect is similar to plique known in Japan as shotai jippo, or removed body enamel, and can be mistaken for it at first glance. In fact, their appearances differ in a number of ways, most notably metal bottoms, metal rims, and feet, 
utilized in plique are not attached to garasatai. Instead, those pieces stand on an integral thick glass foot rim or are footless. In addition, the glass substrate is noticeably thicker than pleak and often deformed because it is unsupported in the kiln by the metal core so that a piece can be somewhat asymmetrical and vary in thickness. Fortunately, traditional Japanese tea ceremony taste admires imperfect, asymmetrical, and deformed ceramics so that deformation is not always fatal to saleability. Japanese plique was first exhibited by one of the two most famous Japanese cloisonné masters of the 19th and early 20th century, Namikawa Sosuke, at the 1893 Chicago Columbian Exposition, and Henry Walters bought a superb piece for him at the 1900 Paris Exposition Universelle, now in Baltimore's Walters Art Museum. Both Soski's technique and his piece's appearance differ from subsequent Japanese makers' work, as he produced his by carving out slivers of silver from a thick silver bowl and then inserting enamel powders into the narrow openings. It was not until the first years of the 20th century that the Japanese developed what became their traditional method and the appearance of Japanese plique and began making it on a regular basis. It was almost certainly made initially by Nagoya's Ando Cloisonne Company. Others, all in the Nagoya area, followed. Japanese traditional plique technique creates pieces whose Japanese provenance is pretty much readily identifiable. Until its final stages, it is similar to the usual method of manufacturing cloisonne, except that as a first step, a primer level of unwired, untinted, translucent enamels is laid down on the copper substrate and fired before any wiring. Wires are then attached to that primer enamel rather than directly to the metal substrate, and the piece is refired. Color tinted translucent enamels with a lower melting point are placed among the wires above the primer level and refired repeatedly in the normal sequence. At each firing, great care is taken that the primer level does not, primer layer, does not melt in order to avoid the wires sinking through to the underlying copper substrate. When the tinted enamels have been piled to a height above the wires, the enamels are ground down to the wire level and given their ultimate polish, once again in the usual sequence. At that point, additional steps are taken that are unique to the manufacturer of shotai. A protective wax or lacquer coating is temporarily placed over the polished external surface, and then nitric acid is used both to remove the inner metal substrate and also to frost the interior or underside of the enamel to, pick, to make the piece more, uni more uniformly translucent. Silver or chrome ribs are rims are attached to finish the piece. In closing, I'll show you one other example of Japanese circa 1900 use of enamel on glass or crystal of quite another sort. Here, enameled engraved silver is wrapped around the outside of a glass or crystal bowl to create a very different aesthetic. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for these pictures. Some are, are impressive from the technology, the, the black and white pictures there. Where did you find them? Uh, they, I, have, I have been collecting ephemera relating to Japanese decorative arts and particularly enameling and cloisonne. Um, and most of those are uh, stereo views. Okay. Not all, but many of them are stereo views. Yeah. And excuse me, after I will give you the, the I have a question. Um, in the, in the bibliography, I don't have uh, much uh, references on, on, on Japanese or Chinese enamels. Are they quite ancient? You're, do you the, as, I, as I mentioned, the modern and most of Japanese enamels of any kind uh, started in 1830. But about 1600, there were some enamel, small pieces, sword guards, sword fittings of small pieces were made. And also Champlevé enamels came in about 1600. And there are some pieces earlier than that, but very occasional uh, pieces that are in palaces and, more, and, and uh, temples but and not clearly Japanese made, probably, but not necessarily. Uh, there are, there's pieces early as six or 700 AD that's in, the, in, in Nara. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have a question? Yes, there is a question here. 
Terry. Uh, this is uh, something that we were talking about at, at lunch that I thought others might be interested in, and that is that um, uh, when the um, new enamel colors were being developed, uh, uh, probably when, the, um, when Wagner and other mm. uh, German chemists were coming into Japan, uh, that uranium salts were introduced into the making of enamels. And so in some cases, the, um, uh, the Japanese cloisonne pieces are actually radioactive. And so it's just something you should be aware of. But also, um, around the same time, uh, just getting back to Limoges painted enamels, we're finding in our collection that some of the uh, Limoges enamels are radioactive, and either because they're made in the late 19th century as revival pieces, or there are restorations that have been done at the time that are done with um, probably uranium salt. So it's something just to be aware of. And if people would walk through their storerooms and walk through their collections, maybe with a Geiger counter, and it might be interesting to see if there are uh, certain studios that maybe were using uh, restoration materials or were producing enamels during certain times that we can relate in some way. And Donna Strand wrote a... Uh, I just want to tell you quickly that in the 70s or early 80s, there was a movement that um, yellows and oranges produced here in the United States had uranium in them and would no longer be able to be even the product to be shipped to enamelists because UPS wouldn't take it anymore. Uh, in 1943, during the war, when people began to realize the dangers of uranium products, the United States made it illegal to, to use that in, either, in ceramic. There is, it's in ceramic glazes, of course, as well as, as glass. And after the war, during the occupation, the Americans stopped the Japanese from using it. I just wanted to just do a really quick follow-up, and that is that um, although like, things like fiesta wear and things like that, it was reds and yellows, a lot of the um, earlier uh, radioactive ones can be grays and browns and blacks, and they're all different colors. Exactly. There is a, before people rush off to panic about this radioactivity, um, we, <laughs> we panicked at the V&A and had them measured and I think it was the glass, not, not enamels. And they were found that to be okay for public, you know, for, for them to be on display. So don't panic, just measure them first. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Terry was quite clear at lunchtime on that. And Steve Koob once said to me, you know, don't put it on your bedstand next to where you sleep or under your pillow, uh, hoping for the enamel fairy to bring you something. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's. No, just as an addendum to this, it's exactly as June says, two colors specifically, a burnt orange and a forsythia, were proclaimed radioactive, but later the manufacturer said it was spent uranium. However, I know someone who did test with a Geiger counter and did get a response to it. They are off the market, but they're beautiful, glowing colors. Yeah, they're off the market, except for second, you know, a, a secondary market, of course, and, and, and you know, auction pieces and so forth. I did test, uh, Donna Strand's written a little bit about Wagner and the, his lecturing in, I guess, in, I think in Kyoto on, on uranium and, and its use in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to just follow up with something that Juanita said, and she's absolutely correct. The readings that you get, I don't want to cause panic. I'm, I'm actually mentioning this because I would like to know if there are other pieces that we can relate uh, to these pieces. But in the testing that we did, um, first of all, distance from them uh, makes them totally safe. But also, uh, just, we just put plexiglass in front of ours, and you can't detect the readings once you put the plexiglass in front of it. So it's not something to panic about. It's just an interesting thing that might help us relate some, some studios. Right, and not something normally you won't drink out of enameled cups anyway, but one doesn't want to drink out of uranium glasses, I suppose. Is there another question? No? OK, so thank you very much. Thank you.